By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to another episode of The Tribal Wars. We're going to look at a match between two tribes. We have robots, aka constructs, played by Anders. And he's taking on my Homerids. I'm playing a Homerid deck. I'm really excited to kind of show you the deck. Now, for people that uh, missed the episode last week, you can, of course, look at that episode. It was uh, Kobolds versus Wolves. What I have done here on Timmy Talks is I've organized a tribal tournament so that means that all the decks that people are building here should have at least 12 creatures of the same creature type and they can also uh, choose cards out of the sets fallen empire homelands and a selection of cards out of the set ice age and i've done that for the simple reason that i want to see as many crazy tribes as possible right and in today's episode like i said we're going to look at constructs aka robots versus homerids now before i jump into the deck tech i would like to first mention that if you want to skip this and go straight to the games the easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps one of those timestamps is mtg games if you click on there it will take you straight to the gaming action and also the description is really handy if you want to know more about the rules of this tournament because there's also a link to the tournament website where you can find all the info about the rules and you can see more awesome deck photos uh, of, of, of all the players. Um, so now that you're completely informed, I'm going to start with the deck deck. I'm going to start with the deck of my opponent. Let's take a look at his constructs deck. And here we see the deck of Anders Cyberdyne Systems. And that of course is a reference to the Terminator movies. We also see our big friend there on the playmat here. So it's a pretty cool deck photo. And uh, when we look at this deck, it is a robots deck, right? But there are some interesting things happening here. So robots is kind of referring to all the artifact creatures that are actually now after the big Magic the Gathering creature update are now all constructs. So all these artifact creatures you see in this deck are constructs. So the four trikes, the four suchis, the two tetravis and the two dragon engines, that 12 creatures in total, they're all constructs. So obviously what you want to do with this deck is try to like play out your big artifact creatures copy them with copy artifact or if they're in the graveyard you want to get them back with your anime deaths right and kind of build an army of robots preferably build an army of triskelions because they're just super good with that option to deal three damage to any target of course with those counters on the trike so that is a super good deck but um there are some interesting things happening in this deck first of all there is no power you know there are no moxen there's no blue power so it's a powerless robots build which i, I really kind of like i think it's super cool um, I guess you cannot call it budget because you've got, you know, you've got all those dual lands in there. You've got Chaos Orbs, uh, Wheel of Fortune. Uh, but for budget, for, for old school, it is kind of, I would say, budget friendly. Not really, but you know what I mean, because it doesn't have those power tools. Um, an interesting card here that Anders has chosen for is Priest of Yakmov. In these decks, you usually see people choosing to play with Sage of Latinam. Sage of Latinam is a 1-2 blue creature where you can tap and sacrifice an artifact to draw a card. Well, Priest of Yakmov is kind of the black version of that. It's also a 1-2. It's one black and one. You can tap it to sacrifice an artifact and add an amount of black to the... Um, Sacrifice artifacts mana value. So you're looking at the casting cost of the artifact. For example, if it's four and then you're gonna get four um, black mana, right? That's kind of what it does. So it's really nice to combine, for example, with a drain life. Now we don't see a drain life here, but we do see a fireball in the deck. So, you know, when everything is right, he can actually sack his Suchi during the main phase with his Priest of Yakmov. Then he'll get four black mana because of that, because of the Priest of Yakmov's ability, and he will also get four colorless mana because of the Suchi ab ability, meaning he's got eight mana, and then of course he can use those eight mana to spend it on a fireball, right? So that is pretty sweet. Another cool thing he can do here is with the Tetravus, uh, it is a creature that during your upkeep, you can take a plus one, plus one counters from Tetravus to make little Tetravites one, one flyer. So he can take those off, that he has three one, one flyers, and then he's got the six casting cost artifact creature which is just a 1-1 one, one. he could sack it to the priest of Yakmov, get six mana you know from that ability of the priest and then he can like cast another tetravis or you know he can cast a trike of course another really nice synergy oh i don't see that card in here i was assuming it was in here i don't see oh i do see okay for a moment i thought he was playing without brain geyser okay no he's got a brain geyser so he can use of course that mana as well to fuel his brain geyser so i mean I like it. I really like the fact that he's playing with Priest of Yakmov. I hope he's able to, to show the Priest of Yakmov. I think I'm playing Homerids today. I think I'm in for a really, really tough match because this looks like 
a super solid list. Anyway, uh, this is the deck of Anders and now we're going to have a look at my deck. Let's take a look at uh, a bunch of Hammerits. And here we see my deck, I've called it Powered by Hammerits because I'm just playing all the power that I have <laughs> and I've combined it with Hammerits and some kind of uh, Hammerits spawning bed strategy, reanimator strategy. Uh, I think it's really, really funny, but I really, you know, when I looked at the cards that were gonna form the, set, the, 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 the idea for this deck, I was like, I need to add all the power that I have because maybe that can kind of make it work. I just need to put all the mean cards in here as well. I need that shell to even stand a chance against decks. Because if you look at Hammerits, they're really, really bad. I mean, look at this. It's one blue and two to cast for a two, two creature that comes into play with a tight counter on it. And when it's got one tight counter, the tight's not quite right. It gets minus one, minus one. That means I'm play, uh, paying three mana for a one, one creature. Remember, my opponent is playing with Triskelions. So it, 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 this is super dangerous, right? I can play it, he can shoot it down. Now, obviously, Every turn it gets a tight counter. I won't bore you with all the effects, but in the third turn, it is a 3-3 three, three creature. So that's when I basically get a reward for playing with these weird Hammerits. But one of the things I've noticed, because I'm also playing with Hammerit Warrior and Deep Spawn, is that all these uh, Hammerits, they are kind of expensive to cast, right? They're not as cheap as like a Merfolk, for example. So I wanted to combine these creatures with Hammerit Spawning Bad. And Hammerit Spawning Bad is actually kind of good. It's too blue for an enchantment. Um, then you've got to pay a two blue and one. You can sacrifice uh, a blue creature and then you get one one uh, Kamaritz, which is basically a Hammerit baby, equal to the casting cost of the creature, the blue creature that you sacrifice. So my Hammerit is three, so I would get three one ones. My Hammerit warrior, warrior is five, so I would get five one ones. And the cool thing is I can play this effect as a fast effect, right? I can do it anytime as long as I've got those mana open to do it. So if I have my Hammerit spawning bed and I have, let's say, a Hammerit warrior, I can just attack or block with my Hammerit warrior. And if then something happens that I don't like before damage is dealt, I can sack it to my spawning bed and I can just get a lot of one-on-one -on -one creatures back. And then of course, I'm also playing with animate dead because if you've got the sack strategy, then you can at least get them back from the graveyard with your animate dead and I can, you know, sack them again to my Hammerit spawning bed. Now I'm also playing, of course, with um, Hell's Caretaker, only one because it's a pretty difficult combo to pull off, but Hell's Caretaker is one black and three and during my upkeep, I can sacrifice a creature. So tap it and I got to sacrifice a creature and then I can get target creature from my graveyard back into the game. Now this is really cool, right? So if I've got Hammerit spawning bed, Hell's Caretaker and let's say a Hammerit Warrior on the field, I got my own Kamarit token fish factory. I mean, <laughs> how cool is that? So that is the dream. I'm hoping to build a fish factory. Maybe I should call this deck fish factory because that's basically what I want to do and I want to attack. Now, obviously, uh, Anime Dead also goes together really well with Deep Spawn. So Deep Spawn is eight mana to cast. It's actually a pretty good card in my opinion. It's a six, six trampler, which is good to trample. I love that. But also for one blue, you can kind of give it hexproof. What happens is if you play blue, um, it cannot be targeted anymore, but it does tap itself and it stays tapped the next turn. So, you know, you cannot use it. But that doesn't really matter because, you know, I can keep it in play long enough to maybe find a spawning bed and then, you know, sacrifice my deep spawn to the spawning bed and get like eight one ones, you know, that's awesome. So what I want to do basically is just cast my Hammerits, sack them to the spawning bed and overwhelm my opponents with this, these little Kamerit tokens. The cool thing is if you look at the bottom of the deck photo, you can actually see the original tokens that were given uh, with the Duelist Fallen Empire magazine. You know, Fallen Empires had a huge impact on tokens and counters in Magic the Gathering. It really laid the groundwork for, for all those token decks that we, uh, that we have today. Um, well, this is the deck. Maybe I missed a few things in this deck, but um, feel free to pause here and, and have a good look at this deck. I was really happy with the deck. Did it win a lot? Well, you know, I mean, it's Hammerits, but still, I was really happy. And, and I just hope that in this matchup against Anders, I can show you guys some interesting games and I'm not gonna be wiped out completely by all these robots. I mean, I got a lot of power and I got pretty good cards in this deck as well, like Brain Geyser and Power Sync and Mind Twist and Demonic Tutor and Time Walk and Sestral Recall. I can ramp up with my with my Moxin. So yeah, who knows? There's always a chance. So are you ready? Let's go to the tribal match, Hammerits versus Constructs. Here we go. Game number one, here we go. Constructs versus Hammerits and Anders is the Construct player on the left. Look at him go here with a Sol Ring into a Fowerstone. 
Oh man, this is horrible. He can have like a turn to Suchi or something, or hopefully for me it's a dragon engine. And I'm playing a temple, a sec land from uh, Fallen Empires that comes into play tapped. You can tap it for one blue or tap and sack it for two blue. There's the Suchi by Anders. This is gonna be immediate pressure for me. This is really bad. Okay, finding an ancestral recall. I mean, hopefully this is like a dream scenario. I can now discard a deep spawn and animate the deep spawn. That would be awesome. Let's see what I'm gonna discard here because I'm playing out an underground sea. Discarding a Homerit, okay. I think I gotta discard another one. I'm hoping for deep spawn. No, it's another Homerit. Oh, that's bad. If it would have been a deep spawn, it would have been so perfect. I would have a great blocker for the Suchi and just, well, not, not just a blocker, just a way to attack Anders with as well. But unfortunately for me, there is no, there is no deep spawn there. Just two Homerits now. Uh, seven in hand past the turn. And Anders now playing out another land, attacking for six, of course, animating his factory. I'm going to drop to 14. Oh, this is so bad. This is so bad. Finding an island. Okay, what can I do? I mean, he can animate Dead Ahamarit, but that's not going to help. Ooh, second to Temple, four mana. Nevenerl's Disc. This is great. I'm so lucky finding the disc. I'm playing with one disc in my deck, and this disc is perfect because if I can... Blow up the disc next turn. I'm destroying the Felwer Stone, the Sol Ring, and the Suchi. I guess he's going to swing in for six first. So that means I'm going to drop to eight. And I'm probably going to wait with using the disc until it's Anders' turn again. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, I guess. Anders a little bit in the tank here. I think if you're Anders, you don't want to play out anything and just swing in for six. Put me on eight. That's exactly what he does here. Going to drop to eight. It looks like I'm taking my turn. Yep, gonna untap, gonna draw a card for turn. Hopefully I can find a land. And I'm probably just gonna pass here. Six in hand still, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, six in hand. Probably just gonna pass. And the interesting thing to note here is that if Anders attacks, uh, I want to detonate the disc during the combat step. Because that way Anders cannot really use the four mana from the Suchi. Or, well, he can use it, but only for instance. Or, for example, to animate his factory, but why would he want to do that? I think if you're honest, you don't want to animate your factory, by the way, because if you swing in for six, you're going to give your factory to me for free, because then I can detonate my Neverworld's disc. So here he's attacking using my disc. So destroying three cards on the side of Anders, including that huge Suchi, so I'm really happy with that. That means at least I'm on eight, which is something. Hopefully now Anders cannot recast the Suchi. That would be pretty devastating for me. And I'm hoping, you know, maybe I've got like, um, uh, like for, for example, an anime debt and I can animate the Suchi. That would be kind of awesome. And Anders just passing the turn. This is perfect. So this disc kind of got me back into a game. I mean, I'm still on an eight. Okay, playing a Mox Pearl. Hopefully I can have another land as well. Tapping two here. Is there going to be an anime dead? Yes, an anime dead. So probably going to get back the Suchi from the graveyard exactly of Anders. So now I've got a 3-4 Suchi because remember it gets minus 1, minus 0 from the anime dead. But now I've got a 3-4 Suchi, which is pretty sweet. I'm actually already happy how this game is going. I'm still in it. But I'm hoping to, of course, cast some Homerits for you guys and make some Kamarits. That's the dream of the deck. So passing the turn to Anders. Let's see what he can do. I mean, we're both not playing with, with white, so we don't have access to Disenchants. I'm going to untap here. Six cards in hand. I mean, I guess I don't want to attack because if I do Anders takes three and next turn he can attack me for two with the factor, I'm going to drop to six. You don't really want that. Okay, tapping two again. No, untapping one blue. What can I do for one blue? Oh, I'm looking at my graveyard. Maybe I've got another anime dead. I, I, I think I need to play a spawning bet first if I want to do that. 
Oh, there it is, Homerit Spawning Bat. So this is part of my strategy, right? Homerit Spawning Bat, an enchantment from Fallen Empires, two blue and one, sacrifice a blue creature, and you get one, one Comerit tokens equal to the casting cost of the blue creature. I, I personally think the card's pretty good. It sees very little play, but I think it's, it's pretty good. Can you imagine having some kind of like blue flyers build with like Mahamoti Jins and stuff and then at the moment that they destroy your creature in response you can sack it to the spawning bat and get like 6 1-1 one, one creatures? That is pretty good. So I'm untapping here. So Anders is kind of stuck. He's giving me some momentum. Playing out an island. What can I do with the time now that Anders has given me? I can now play an animate dead, get a homerid back, which is potentially 3 one ones which is not too shabby. I can get it back, which also allows me to kind of attack with my Suchi, because at a certain point I need to start dealing some damage. So what do I want to do with the mana? It looks like we're discussing a few scenarios here. Okay, playing my anime dead, I was expecting that, so I think I'm going to get back a... Homer it, which is now actually a 0-1 because it, it's got a tight counter on it. Oh, this card's so bad. This card is so bad. And here you see a tight counter, the official Fallen Empire cardboard counters. I'm really, I'm really happy right now, actually, to kind of see this. To, I mean, the deck is kind of doing what it wants to do, which is nice. And uh, I know it's not very, you know, it's not super powerful, but it's, it just always feels good when a deck does what you want it to do. Anyway, attacking for three here, going to put Anders on 17. So putting a little bit of pressure on, passing the turn. Now, one of the scenarios that can happen next turn with Anders is that he attacks with this factory. I can block on my 0-1 Homerit, and then before damage is dealt, I can sack it to the spawning bat, and I can get three 1-1s. One and I, I, I think that's good, you know, because I've got to find a way somehow to put some pressure on Anders. Anders is buying, is giving me time. Hopefully, uh, you know, he's, he's stuck with a lot of six casting cost creatures in hand and he cannot find the lands to cast it. You know, so, so that would kind of be ideal. So passing the turn, Anders finding a land from the top of the library. So he almost has that six, uh, that, uh, that six lands, six mana available. Which opens up a lot of opportunities for his deck, right? So he's passing the turn end step. I'm sacking the Homerit here to the Homerit spawning bat, getting three one ones. That is sweet. I can actually swing in. Although, of course, then he's gonna animate the factory, it's gonna block on that. So I gotta think what to do here. Maybe just attack with the Suchi alone. Playing an island. Attacking here with the 3-4. Now the problem, of course, is if Anders finds another land from the top, he probably has a trike in hand. He can play the trike. And he can deal a lot of damage. Tapping 4. Oh, Hell's Caretaker! I got the fish factory! This is so cool. Oh no! Oh, oh yeah! Doing it, baby! Mana drain on a mana drain, protecting my Hell's Caretaker. So Hell's Caretaker is huge, right? During my upkeep... I can sacrifice a creature, in this case a 1-1 one, one Kamari token, to get a creature back from my graveyard, in this case a Homerit, and then I can sack the Homerit. Oh man, Lightning Bolt. This is just, ah, oh, this is not cool. This is not cool. This is a bit of a letdown, I'm going to be honest with you. I was really looking forward to show you guys the Fish Factory. It's not meant to be, I guess. Not yet, at least. Let's see what uh, else Anders can do here. Playing a copy artifact. It's going to copy the Suchi, of course. Oh, that's a problem. Because his Suchi is a 4-4, because it doesn't have the animate on it. Oh, that is annoying. That is annoying. And I used my Mana Drain to protect, of course, my Hell's Caretaker, which made sense, but... It it died anyway, so... Okay, anime dead! Yeah, yeah! Hell's Caretaker's back in town! Oh, that is pretty sweet. That is really sweet. Okay, so my Hell's Caretaker's back. Hopefully it can stay on the board. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed here. No, 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 Triskelion! Power Sync! Yes! 
power sinking it. This is brilliant. Power sinking the trike. Trike's a goner. I just want to show you guys the health caretaker trick. It's going to be so much fun. Understaking a damage from his own city of brass because he's got to tap it with, with the power sink. So untap, upkeep. I'm forgetting my health caretaker here. Oh, that's so bad. Why am I doing this? Look at that. I was already drawing. And I forgot the caretaker because I can only do it in my upkeep. So this is a big mistake on my part. Looks like I'm going for my graveyard. Maybe he's asking how many counter spells I've played out. I think I've played a mana drain and a power sink. And I've got Hammerids in my graveyard. I'm now actually pointing out that I forgot the upkeep momentum of the caretaker. I forgot that you can only do it during your upkeep. I'm putting my dice on my deck right now. And Anders was kind enough, by the way, to say, you know what, you can still do it, it's fine. But I was like, no, 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 no. I need to learn how to play with these cards. And even though I don't play with Hell's Caretaker a lot, I just need to learn how to play with it. Oh, another power sink. Yep. That is sweet. This is great news for me. Anders dropping to 11 here. So now I'm going to use the Caretaker. Finally, I'm paying attention. So sacking a Comerit, getting a Homerit back. This is exactly what I want to do. So getting a 1-1 Homerit that I can sack to the Homerit spawning bat, making even more tokens. Playing a Diamond Valley. This is ideal. I'm on 8. Maybe I can actually win this game. I'm completely back into this. When I saw Anders and, and how he started the match, I thought I was toast. But I managed to get back into this. Now remember, I'm two power sinks and a mana drain down. There's a Tetravis. Nothing I can do about it. Just letting it happen A 4-4. At least I've got the Diamond Valley. What I could do next turn is just attack with everything. Or we'll keep 1-1-1 one, one, one as a chump blocker and, you know, just go and attack. And sack uh, the Suchi if it gets blocked. Sacking again a Homerit. So now we really have that fish factory going, but it, it, it's just going a tad bit too slow. Okay, playing a storage land from Fallen Empires is pretty cool. Every upkeep that I keep it tapped, it gets a, uh, a counter on it, a storage counter, and then I can untap it, tap it for an X amount of blue equal to the storage counters. I do have to take them off. But uh, it's pretty nice. It's just a way to store some mana, but I only have one card in hand though. I mean, this... By the fact that it's going okay-ish, it's not going great. I mean, I can attack with my five creatures, but it's going to kill two in the block, and then I can, will be able to deal three points of damage. I think I should have done that, to be honest, because I could have sacked Tsuchi, gained four life, went up to 12. I think I should have done that. I'm being too passive here. I think I should have attacked three points of damage, means he goes down to eight. I can still chum block. With the one Homerate I've got, I mean, are we going to see a trike now? Brain Geyser, oh! And he's keeping that one mana open, I think hoping to find maybe a bolt to bolt my Caretaker. Has he found a bolt? Or even what's really good as well in this scenario is another Triskelion. Now remember, I already countered two trikes, but if he can find another trike, it's super devastating for my board, right? He can, can kill the Caretaker. Obviously, he cannot play a trike right now. He doesn't have the mana for it, but next turn. Attack here with the Tetra is going to drop to four. Yes, I'm second to Suchi now anyway, so I think what I should have done, and it's always easier when you look back at these games, right? You realize stuff, but what I should have done the last turn was just do a full-on attack. You know, I really should have done that. Um, I should tap three mana here, by the way, not two. It doesn't matter too much for the game, but still. Untapping, upkeep, gonna probably use my caretaker here, gonna put a counter on my storage land. The cool thing about that storage land, by the way, it's sand silos. It's, uh, it shows you little Homerate houses. So it's really on flavor as well. It's where the Homerates live. So I've got a 1-1 uh, a Homerate and a lot of 1-1 creatures. I should just attack it with my 1-1 army. Come on. 
put some pressure on. I could attack with five, and he can he can block one because he also has that factory. I can block two. Look at that going in there, attacking with five of them exactly. No, si all six. Okay, that's a daredevil move. And so one of the blockers, I'm actually going to sack to the Diamond Valley before damage is dealt. So I'm going to go up to nine. And he's going to take four points of damage. Look at his life total. He's on six now. I felt like I... Oh, man. I'm a little bit annoyed with myself for missing that combat step earlier where, where I should have attacked. Anyway, um, I'm expecting him now to put full pressure on... Can he do that, actually? I don't think he can just attack with everything. Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, he can attack. He's got the 4-4 four, four Suchi, the 4-4 four, four Tetravis. And he's got... Ooh, he's got three Mishra's Factories. I thought he had two. He's got three Mishra's Factories. Oh, no, this is bad. Well, of course, I can sack... Oh, I wonder what he's going to do here. I can sack the Homerit to the Homerit Spawning Bat. Uh, that gives me three one ones to block with. Yeah, he's going to animate, so he's got two two twos. Look at him attack. Look at him go. Oh! I got to... If I block the Suchi with my Hummer, then sack it to the spawning bed and take eight, I could go down to one, and maybe I can still win it. But it looks like I'm choosing a different strategy. I'm sacking the Hummer. It's before blockers are declared. So I've got three one ones to block with. Probably going to block... All his creatures, which I'm not sure if that's the right strategy. I'm doing it, though. I'm probably afraid of a lightning bolt. But I think I should play towards my outs because I don't really have... You know, that's all I have, really, is just play towards my outs. So, in my opinion, now looking at it, at it back at this match, I think I should have just gone to one... So, I'm on five. He's passing the turn. No, he's not. He's going to do something else. Ooh, that's bad. A recall. It's going to cast a recall. Oh, I think he can get back. What is he going to do? A trike would be... I guess a trike. Trike would be really good. He could also go for a bolt, of course. Probably going to go... Yes. Okay, he's going to fetch a bolt. Yeah, he could bolt the health caretaker. Oh, man. Yeah, it's pretty much over. It is over. It is over. Look at that. If I would have played this a little bit different, I could have won this game. Oh, that's so frustrating. I was so close. I was so close. Tacking with four cameras. It's going to put Anders on two. Then again, if I would have taken the damage, by the way, he would have gotten, he would have played the bolt on my life total and I would have died. Oh, play a time walk. That is sweet. Am I going to win this one with time walk? Playing the time walk, untapping, attacking for four. Here I go. <laughs> Winning game number one with the Hummerance Army. With a little bit of help from Blue Power. A little bit of help. Wow. Okay, so I guess I made all the right decisions because I'm winning the game. I'm so good. I don't even understand my own decision making. This is fantastic. Game number one is in the books. I'm super happy. Uh, now we are going to go dive and dive into our sideboards. And I will catch up with you in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So, of course, it's Anders on the play again after losing that first game. And that was just really, really a surprise after that explosive start by Anders. And look at me go here, Soul Ring turn one. That is pretty sweet. So maybe next turn I can play a Hammerit. That would be pretty cool. Ooh, Copy Artifact, copying the Soul Ring. Copy Artifact is such a good card. I mean, ah, it gives Anders so many options. And now he's ramping up with a Soul Ring. That means he's got more than four mana next turn. So we could potentially see a Suchi. Tapping three here. Oh, Energy Flux. This is devastating for Anders. What a good card for me to find. A card from the sideboard in Enchantment, originally from Antiquities. 
Um, during your upkeep, you've got to pay two mana per artifact or else the artifact gets discarded. So you can see your Anders is tapping a soul ring to pay for a soul ring. So this is, this is perfect. Playing an Urborg there instead of his dual land. There's a Demonic Tutor. What could he tutor for? I mean, I guess he wants to get rid of the Energy Flux. I'm assuming he's playing with Red Elemental Blast. So that could be an option. Or maybe the Energy Flux is not that big of a bother, but I can't imagine it is not because he's playing with, you know, he's playing with so many artifacts. Let's see what he's going to do. If it is a blast, yeah, he's not going to blast it now because he wants me to pay for my own soul ring. I mean, Energy Flux works for both players, right? Uh, playing an Underground Sea here, tapping three. Okay, there's a Hammerit. Now remember, it comes into play with a tight counter on it, so it's just a 1-1 one, one for now. Each upkeep, you put another tight counter on it. Uh, with two tight counters, it's just a 2-2. Two, two. With three tight counters, it is a 3-3. Three, three. And when it's got four tight counters, you take all the tight counters off again, so it's a 2-2 two, two again. Oh, there we see Red Elemental Blast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of saw it coming. But it's not nice to see. At least I slowed Anders down a little bit. He could go to six mana. Are we going to see a trike? A Suchi. Okay, that's bad, but it's not super bad. So there's a 4-4 Suchi. I'm tapped out. Cannot counter it. I'm going to untap. My Hammerit is now a 2-2 with the second tight counter. Oh, man. This is, this is tough. Playing an island. Six mana. Do I have a deep spawn? That would be so cool. Would be kind of risky because Anders has got all his mana open. He can counter it. But still. Okay, I'm not doing anything, I guess. So we're not we're not sure. I'm just passing the turn, which is bad news for me because it means Anders can now attack, of course, with his Suchi. He plays another Soul Ring. So he's got a lot of mana. Seven mana there. That is That looks very scary. Going to put me on 16 with the Suchi attack. He's going to put his uh, life totals back together there with the dice. And look at that. Three tight counters. So it's now a 3-3. Three, three. It's a super strong homerate. The tide is right. And I'm moving in. Or was it moving on? I don't know. It's a song reference. Anyway, I've got play City of Brass. I can attack you for three. Going to put Anders on 17. Which is something. Or is he going to bolt? Are you going to bolt my Hammerit? Don't do it, Anders. Don't do it. Don't you dare. Okay, so he's going to go to 17. There's a time walk. Okay, finding a time walk again. The card that gave me the victory in game number one. So that means I can attack again with my Hammerit. This is pretty cool. Hammerit doing some work. I can deal five points of damage with one Hammerit. So untapping again, so it's going to get another tight counter. That means the tight counters are going to go off. All the tight counters go off. I'm going to untap. So untap, upkeep, tight counters go off. Now we're at the draw step and we're going to go into our main phase. Of course, I can attack Anders again. He's going to drop to 15. So deal five points of damage with a single Hammerit. I'm pretty impressed with myself here. Four cards in hand. This is unfortunate though. Just passing the turn. I need some kind of follow-up. And how cool would it have been if I could have found a deep spawn and played a time walk and have two attacks with the deep spawn? That would be would have been epic. Now I'm going to drop to 12 with another attack by the Suchi. There's a trike. I'm expecting a counter spell here from my part. There we see a power sink. Or are we going to see a counter spell? Oh, mana drain. That is a big problem. Yeah, that is that is huge. This this counter by Anders is huge. Because next turn my Hammer turns into a 1-1. One, one. He can easily kill it. He can then deal seven. I'm gonna drop to five. This yeah, this is huge. This is this is extremely painful, this mana drain for me. But I mean, you know, he's got Mana Drain, he's got Red Elemental Blast, so there was, of course, uh, an option for it to happen, but I had to try and counter it, obviously. Tapping two blue. Hammer it spawning bad. Okay, at least that's something. In response to the Hammer it spawning bad, Anders is killing my Hammer it, which makes absolute sense. It's a good move. 
Yeah, it's dead. Um, maybe it's nice to know, by the way, with the sideboarding rules of this tournament, you have to have your 12 tribal creatures in your deck at all times. So, um, you know, after sideboarding, it's not like I can say, you know what, I'm just going to take out all my homerids and I'm going to put something else in. That's not possible. So that was a little rule that we came up with to make sure that you keep playing with your tribal creatures. Uh, here we see Anders attacking, by the way. He's also animating. Does he have a factory? Of course he does. Attacking with the factory as well. So that's nine points of damage. I'm dead already? I think he can pump the factory to 10 and then he's got two more points on the trike. I think I'm dead. That's it. That's game number two. Oh, man. Oh, I had a deep spawn. Why didn't I play the deep spawn? Why didn't... I, I don't know. I guess I wanted to protect the deep spawn with a blue to give it shroud in case of red blast or something. So I just wanted to wait one more turn. Anyway, I am dead here in game number two, but well played by Anders. And uh, we're going to shuffle up and we're going to go to the decisive game number three. Game number three. Who is going to win this epic battle? Constructs versus Homerits. I'm still in it to win it. I'm super happy with that. Uh, playing an underground sea here and passing the turn. There is a volcanic island into a soul ring. We're seeing a lot of soul rings. Ancestral recall. Okay, finding my ancestral recall again. Drawing some cards. Hopefully I can find my soul ring. Problem here is, of course, for me that Anders can now again play a Suchi a turn two. That's something that we've seen happen far too often in this matchup, for me at least. I could consider keeping counter mana open. If I can just keep a uh, power sink open. Okay, changing my mind here. Asking Anders if that's okay. So he's saying it's fine. Playing a sand silos. Taking that back again. <laughs> this is so messy. Sorry, Anders, man. This is... I know what I'm doing. I probably realized, I'm, wait a minute. If I do this, I cannot counter anything anymore. Anyway. Oh, of course, tapping it down. Why not? Why not? Demonic Tutor, okay. Ah, interesting. Am I gonna look up like an energy flux maybe? I have no idea what I'm doing here. I think I probably have kind of a difficult hand with a lot of options, but I guess power sync is not part of the options. If I would have had a power sync in hand, I would have just kept my mana open. I'm quite sure of that. Because the power sink is, of course, an easy, the perfect answer for Anders potentially playing out a Suchi turn two. You know, he's going to tap out, play a Suchi, I can play power sink. Taking my, my time here, uh, maybe I'm not sure what I'm going to look for. I think an energy flux would be a pretty good decision. I can play it out next turn. Obviously, there's always a risk that Anders maybe has like a red elemental blast or something. But I mean, so be it. It's never bulletproof. Oh, look at that. I'm actually changing my mind again. I'm very undecisive here. Perhaps since it's 1-1 and I'm kind of feeling that I, I may have a, a chance of winning this match. I get, I don't know. I get more undecisive. Discarding a deep spawn here. Oh, so perhaps I took an animate dead. I'm going to animate the deep spawn. That would be pretty sweet. Under stepping four, playing out his Suchi. Do I have an animate dead? Sand silos? Okay, we expected that. Do I have an animate dead? Yes, I got the animate. This is so sweet. Five, six trampler. This is so cool. I am really happy with this play. No matter what happens, man, I'm super happy. Oh, okay, now, no. I said no matter what happens, but not like this, Anders. Not like this. <sighs> you tried to do cool stuff, and uh, just you, you don't always get a reward for that, do you? I guess that's, uh, that's part of the game, but it is a little bit frustrating here. Deep Spawn being killed. Ooh, Priest of Yawkmoth, a card that I talked about in the deck deck. I'm quite excited. Anders, that you uh, play a Priest of Yakmoth in your deck. I think it's a really cool creature. Now, I'm going to drop to 14. I've got, I've got a problem. And it's called a Suchi. And I, I need to find an answer for it. Hopefully, I've got another anime dead. But those chances are quite slim. 
just passing the turn, not even having a land drop. Oh, yuck. This is bad. Tapping three, Dragon Engine. It is cool to see a Dragon Engine and a Priest of Yagmoth. I really like to see uh, like to see those creatures. You don't see that that often. Playing a Mana Drain. Going to go to 13, Mana Drain on the Dragon Engine. At least it's going to give me three mana. And uh, he's going to attack here. I believe he also animated his one factory. So he's going to deal seven. I'm going to drop to six. Uh, so much pressure here from Anders. And that's something that he's been doing, you know, from the start. He's been able to kind of ramp up quite successfully and put on a lot of pressure on my life total from the start. And my deck really needs some time or I need to find those mocks. And I haven't been quite lucky with the mocks. And I have found a lot of power, though. I can't complain about that. Oh, Golgovian Silex. That is, that is so cool. So Golgovian Silex, I believe it's in my sideboard. I can pay, I think, is it two in sec? I hope it's two because I've got two mana open. Two and sack the Silex, destroy everything from the Antiquities expansion. Oh, I'm asking, I'm, I'm just playing super sloppy. I'm sorry, Anders. And I think, or is Golgovian Silex three and act, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna activate the Silex, only one, I guess. So activating the Silex, destroying everything here on the side of, of Anders, which is really, really good. Six cards in hand. So just like in game one where I had that successful Navanerals disc activation, I now have my Golgovian Silex destroying the two Mishra's factories, the Priest of Yakmoth and the Suchi, which is pretty huge. And maybe Golgovian Silex should see more play. Let me know if you think that too. Because you hardly ever see it. Animate that. Oh, is he going to animate my deep spawn? Oh! Anders, you're such a boss. Oh no, he's going to kill me with my own deep spawn. It is a 5-6 now. Oh, 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 that's brutal. That is brutal. I think he's going to have a look and try to find his own copy of deep spawn to put it on the animate. Yeah, oh, this is so brutal. I got to give it to you, Anders. If, if I lose, then let it be by my own deep spawn. This is a very cool way of... Uh, of winning this game. I'm on five. The deep spawn's a five six. I need a blocker. I've untapped the silos. I'm gonna go to four, I guess. Yeah, play a Hummerit. So I'm gonna jump block. No, but it's got trample. It's not gonna work. It's not going to work. It's got Trample. And remember, my Hummerit is a 1-1 one -one because of that stupid tight counter. So he's going to kill me. Uh, why did they design the tight counter stuff like this on the card? What if they would have said Hummerit comes into play and if it has an uneven amount of tight counters, it gets plus 1, plus 1. If it's got even, it stays a 2-2. Two -two. Then the card would be so, well, not good, but it would be so more playable, whatever I want to say. Anyway... There's the attack. I am dead because I'm going to jump block the Homerid, of course, and I'm going to take the trample damage, which is exactly four. But Anders, man, congratulations. What a cool way to win this Tribal Wars. And your construct deck looks very, very solid. Congratulations on the win. And also thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you enjoyed this video, please take a moment to like and share and comment. All these things help and are completely free and you really like supporting the channel by doing that. In the meanwhile, we are showing what we've boarded in and out. So I've put on all my energy fluxes that I have in the sideboard and of course the Golgovian Silex. And it's, it's quite hard to board stuff out there. You can see what I've boarded out. On this boarding out, some counter spells, putting on some red elemental blasts and some shatters. Oh man, but where was I? Oh yes, uh, do those three things, especially like the video. It really helps the channel grow. And of course, subscribe if you are new to the channel. Then there is one more thing that you can do. If you really appreciate and enjoy my content, please take a moment to take a look at uh, patreon.com slash timmytalks because there you can find the Patreon page of this channel. And by becoming a patron of the show, you are not just supporting me with your views and your subs and your comments, but you're also helping me financially to keep the channel afloat. It already starts with just $1 a month. So please take a look 
at the Timmy Talks Patreon page and consider becoming a patron. One of the perks is that you can join tournaments just like this. And another nice perk is that your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. Zeke!